Welcome to Made in Science, the official podcast of the University of Stuttgart. My name is Wolfgang Holtkamp and I'm Senior Advisor on International Affairs at the University and also your host today. In this episode, we welcome alumnus Dr. Andreas Kant. He graduated from the University of Stuttgart with a diploma in mechanical engineering in 1984. Already during his studies, he developed an international profile, spending time abroad in an academic exchange in Greece and the USA. Later on in his professional career, he worked in Canada, the US and China. He also acquired a PhD in supply chain management from the University of Magdeburg. Today, he is Global Head of Procurement at Fraunhofer in Munich, Germany. We are excited to have the opportunity to talk with him about change and global challenges, startup culture in Germany and abroad, and the importance of international networks, and finally also about life beyond the office. Andreas, welcome for our conversation this morning. And we would really like to find out how your career is related to the University of Stuttgart. It was a homecoming for you in our last term, so you are still connected to the university. But now you are at Fraunhofer. So just to give our audience an idea again about Fraunhofer, could you introduce that, please? Sure can. Well, Wolfgang, first of all, thank you very much for having me. And as you mentioned, right now, my position is head of procurement at Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. And what most of the people don't know is actually the, the, the pure size of Fraunhofer. Fraunhofer has about 29,000 employees and is actually Europe's largest research institute. It consists of uh, 75 institutes and The research is in pretty much everything you can possibly think of. It goes from energy research over materials, over uh, science with regards to chemistry, with regards to, to health, with regards to medicine. And so, yeah, it is challenging with regards to, to the public tender law where Fraunhofer has to obey being um, a public company as well. And uh, right now, um, over the last about two years, I'm in this position and we're doing many things in order to gain speed, but still stay to the public tender law. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to actually merge the, the two worlds out of industry procurement, where I actually spent most of my professional life and uh, now this, this public tender uh, procurement. So matching of those two worlds is challenging, but it's not impossible. So again, thank you for having me. You said it's not impossible. I would assume that you have made some experiences, both, of course, as you said, in the private sector, and now bringing those also to the public sector. That could mean that there are a lot of changes related to that in your current position that you try to innovate and to bring to Fraunhofer in your area as well. Did you experience at the moment or so far any obstacles when you introduced new ideas that uh, would perhaps be coming from the private sector and trying to bring those into the public sector? A few, but I assume that's pretty much always happening if you're applying change um, and not necessarily in the, in the public sector nor um, industry sector, once you're trying to change things, you will find a few folks that will support that. You will find a few folks that, that are waiting for what's going to happen. And you will find a few folks that are a little, what's the word, are a little um, le leaning backwards and not necessarily the, the greatest fan of, of change in the first place. But what we did in the last two years is actually changes in, in the classical three areas, such as information technology, IT. Second one is, is processes. And third one is organization. We did not necessarily make a major change in, in people, but what I did um, in the last two years by um, hiring um, new people, I was looking more into university graduates rather than, than coming out of um, industry experiences. So, yeah, again, we did a lot of things. Uh, looking at the organization, I, I was uh, closing down one department. 
which was, was dealing with paper, basically. And, and I could not figure why dealing with paper in the, in the 2020s um, still uh, should be something we should spend time with. I was opening another department. I was founding another department. So what I did is I was uh, putting the weight and the responsibilities on more experienced shoulders, looking at the organization, what Fraunhofer was uh, very much focusing on, on the public tender law in the last, I don't know, couple of 10, 15 years. So my perspective is we should focus a little bit more on industry standards, uh, looking at financial healthiness of, of possible suppliers. We should organizational-wise have a look at what is centralized in music, the, the headquarter of of Fraunhofer is, is located in the Hansastrasse in, in Munich. So what, what should be done centrally and what, what should be done decentralized at the institutes within the procurement department? It sounds to me really like you have to manage uh, the change uh, and keep a balance in a way as well and yet come to a new direction, give it a new spin when necessary, as you said, uh, as well. Yeah. Now, with all of that on your plate, you decided also this past term to actually come back to the university and uh, be a lecturer and offer courses here uh, at the University of Stuttgart again. So I wonder why at this moment with, you know, everything else going on, perhaps it led directly to the university again, perhaps it brought back memories of, you know, what happened back when you were a student. Perhaps it is a testing ground. I don't know. Tell us about it. What is the motivation? Well, actually, the main motivation, it, it is extremely and, and tremendously a lot of fun. When, when, I, when I was at university back in, in, in the uh, end of 80s and, and mid 90s, it was thrilling. It was challenging. It was actually sometimes even rough and hard. Uh, trying to get through the courses. Back then it wasn't bachelor and master. Back then it was uh, pre-diploma and main diploma in mechanical engineering. And now being in, in Fraunhofer, I thought I'm, I'm now in procurement for about 25 years. Uh, and I had about, I don't know, more than two, 300 negotiations. Um, I had funny things going on in procurement. I had not so funny things going on in procurement. And I thought, why not passing on this experience, not necessarily on the focus of academia, which I was confronted in dealing with my PhD, but more on the, on the really practical side and trying, trying to get students the, the basic terms on procurement and supply chain management, trying to get them an understanding and how, how things in life and industry actually interact. And we are an extremely, extremely interesting and challenging times right now. I mean, my, my son, uh, who, who will turn 13 this August, we were trying to get the new Xbox Series X on, on last Christmas, and we couldn't. There's just no way you get, could possibly get this Xbox. Same with the new PlayStation 5. Why? Because uh, semiconductor chips are just vanished from the market. And if you look at supply chain, and if you look at the corona crisis, and if you look on the development of wafers, and if you look at the logistics chain, actually, you, you, you predict that. Uh, I mean, looking, looking at how things developed, uh, let's say, back last, I don't know, August, September, you could have probably tell right away, well, you, we will have a semiconductor crisis soon. I just want to pass on those experiences I have, give some insights and, and try to explain how things are linked to each other and how they, how they act and react. And actually have another focus, for instance, on negotiation. Give students the chance to have insight in a few strategies. Now, applying those strategies doesn't mean that you always succeed with what you want to get in a, in a, in a negotiation, but it gives you the chance to be best the best way prepared. And even if you discuss, I don't know, with your with your girlfriend, boyfriend, fiance, if you want to make your holidays at the beach or if you want to make your holidays in the mountains. So the, it's not that the compromise is in the middle of Germany, but a compromise is giving the other one the chance to 
feel understood. And there's a couple of techniques doing that. And this is what I, this is one I want to pass on to students and a couple of more things. And well, now I learned so, suddenly something about, you know, next vacation and uh, <laughs> to negotiate where to, where to go. But, but from both examples, with uh, the semiconductor, but also the nego negotiations, you related to everyday experiences. Maybe the starting point uh, for the discussion, it may be an, an ending point uh, as well here. Um, do you think the example of the supply chain and, and the semiconductors, that this in a globalized world is more of an issue uh, that students who are at the university these days should be more aware of the connected aspects uh, in the world than it was when you were a student, perhaps, because we are, we are moving faster uh, in many ways. The circles are wider at the same time time it also feels sometimes they're a little tighter and to sort of have all this on the plate and and know how to find the best solution for the enterprises they will be working at absolutely right i think it's a little bit well that's just my personal opinion i think it's a little bit going back to the roots you know when i was studying um end of 80s mid 90s kaizen and japanese improvement technologies were the big thing Then information age started. Uh, if I talk to my son or even my daughter, they cannot imagine that there has been a time before internet or before smartphones. And I told them, listen, I was at Georgia Tech in, in the mid in the mid '90s, and uh, we just had the very first large computers there. So then the information technology started, and then you had the dot com thing going on. And now looking at the markets, funnily enough, um, I was lucky that I had the CPO of, of a large Siemens entity making a speech at, at our yearly um, procurement convention. And what he said is looking at shortages and looking at, at supplier relationship, it's not anymore about pushing buttons and it's not so much about earps talking to each other automatically it's more actually going back to to the roots and have a possibly face-to-face -face contact and sometimes even pick up the phone and ask you know how are you doing how how are your operations how is your plant up and running do you have any issues and it's more about a direction and 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 in, in both both ways as in you know i'm i'm your customer but can i do things easier for you can i help you as it in advanced planning that that you need a larger time ahead of of uh, what you're supposed to supply so That's why I named actually my, 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 my lecture here at university value-based supply chain management. And my belief is that if you go back to relationship management, of course, it's much easier these days to switch on, I don't know, Zoom, Teams, and you name it. And, and there's a lot of good thing about it, not actually for, for every meeting jumping into the plane and, and fly up to Hamburg and fly back the same day. So I, I just turn on the computer, but for important topics and for actually a real person relationship management, I found it tremendously more important than it was five or 10 years ago to go back to those personal relationship management. And I think that's, that's something we, we should focus on, young generations should focus on. That's my, my true belief here, yeah. Your experience from the time when you were self-employed may also be useful in this connection when you talk about the value and relationship management because you had that also on a, for a couple of projects i understand that was important to you what would you say to the young people these days when it comes to advise them about being self-employed do the same rules apply that you just talked about you know things about advice um is especially if they're not asked for <laughs> most of the times uh, it's not really worth a lot well being self-employed if if you have an idea that you believe in really i would say go for it take the risk and you need a long breath now that's something that applies actually through my entire life and career if if you do believe in something and you want it It may take a month, it may take a year, it may take up to 10 years. So if you truly believe in it, don't give up. And I think being self-employed, that's, that's probably the rule number one. Uh, you need a really, really long breath. You need some talents. Most of the times you need, you need customers. That means you 
have to have some some sort of sales talent as well for whatever your product is or for whatever service you would like to add to to who's ever paying for it so you need some sales talent there and uh, what can help as well as have a look at financials and and actually legal tax issues now that's extremely unsexy to be honest and I did that when I was um, at my first uh, job in, in, in the United States. I was locally employed, so I had to pay local U.S. taxes. And uh, I, I was buying myself a book, and I read it from first to last page. And when I came over to Germany in, in the end of 90s, same here. I had no idea about German taxes. So I, I read the book from first to last page. So being self-employed, there, there's some funny things as a VAT, value-added tax, and there's something that you have to report on a monthly basis, and there are some deductibles from that. Again, that's not sexy, but you really have to know, at least on the surface about it, so that, you, that you're not getting into any trouble with, with uh, legal and tax on that point of time. In the United States, which you mentioned, no one leaves high school without having developed a founder's project and written a business plan for it. Now, in Germany, that seems to be still a very different situation. It's catching up. I understand it's getting better. And I wonder what your 13-year-old son will experience, or maybe just a little too early, but pretty soon, having classes uh, along these lines um, as well. When you came to Germany and uh, started reading that book that you talked about. What was your conclusion after that in comparing the US and Germany? Did you accept it as just two different worlds? Okay, and I go in each one differently because the rules are as they are. Or did you bring something together as well? You know, yourself being a professor uh, with a, the focus on, on American science, It's actually two worlds, and I think what one never should do is judge. I had I had a, a nice saying many many years ago that that said that the difference between a tourist and a traveler is that the traveler always feels at home right where he is at this specific point in time. So. Looking at the United States, such a huge country. I mean, just just uh, looking at the at the dimensions of this country. You have the East Coast, you have the New York and fellows, then they have this huge, big Midwest and the Californian style. So just going through the country, it's it's about a three days drive from East Coast to West Coast. It's so so huge dimensions, and there are a lot of things in the United States back in the in the mid 90s which I envied, which I said, "Wow, you're doing it great." Looking at the school system, looking at the university system, looking at the way they present themselves, looking at the taxes. To my knowledge back then, that the highest possible tax was about 30 percent. And then coming to Germany, if you're not careful with the taxes, you end up like 50 or 51 tax. And uh, on the other hand, the United States back then had things which I would not necessarily agree with uh, looking at violence looking at having guns um, looking at you know shooting each other and there was even even back then at Georgia Tech which I adore still as a university up until today that we had violence at the campus and you know looking at, at Stuttgart campus looking at Feyen campus I could not imagine um, anyone here running around at night uh, trying to shoot you just because of your I don't know, color of your face. So th there, there are a lot of differences, and, and I shouldn't judge. That there are things I really loved about the United States, some I didn't, and there are things I really, uh, might sound funny, but I really love about Germany and security and, and social and, 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 and health care and, and a lot of things we, we do really, really great at, uh, looking even at this stupid uh, COVID pandemic thing, not stupid, but tragic, that's a better word. I mean, the, the cure, uh, at least as for now, not necessarily Delta, but, but the cure was developed in Germany. So uh, obviously we, we have some very smart scientific people trying to do good things. So, yeah, looking at taxes, I still have tears in my eyes. <laughs> But again, never judge. And I, I was in Canada. Um, I was in South Africa, a uh, short time in, in Japan. I was, you know, I, each country has its up and its downs. And uh, what you should do is realize them, be aware of them. But don't probably don't don't judge. 
and rather be a traveler than a tourist, uh, perhaps as well. I really like that comparison uh, here. Andreas, your international experiences reach back sometime already, but you had many of those. So uh, we'd love to hear more about that. In your past career, when you were a student, it all started already with going abroad. And uh, the two countries that I know about uh, where you went are Greece and the United States. Now, how did that happen? Actually, uh, a lot of um, by occasion. I, I was in, in, in um, today is it master? Back then, I was in the main diploma, and I wanted to go for biomedical engineering. Uh, one day, the professor came in in the lecture and said, "Listen, guys, I, I have about uh, four places Erasmus in, in Patras in Greece on biomedical engineering. So, if you go there, uh, you will get the credits for the course. It's like half a year, and I have four places. And um, if, if you volunteer for it, be be happy to reach out to me." And um, back then we figured, well, we're, we're five students who want to go. And then the, the professor said, oh, well, you know, either I have to choose four, that's an option number one, or option number two is you just divide the money by five. And uh, then I remember we, we five of us, um, after this discussion, going into, into a, a restaurant bar uh, in Stuttgart downtown, um, we had a We had a couple of beers, uh, doesn't have to be with the alcohol, could have been a couple of uh, waters as well. And we made an arrangement, said, yeah, let's, let's all five of us go and uh, just divide the money by five. And actually, that was, that was such a blast, the, the entire journey by, by going down to Greece on, on a ferry, Which, which suddenly, uh, in the, being in the pitch dark night, suddenly all engines of that, of that ferry stopped. There was a shortcut, apparently, on the, on the electric system of, of this ferry, of, of finally getting at the student hostel, which was a, a former mental nursing home and had bars in front of the window. Uh, but we had a flat roof and we had breakfast every morning and we could see the, the sea on, on front of us and we had the mountains on the back. And we had about, it was about, about 30 students from all over Europe, from Portugal, Spain, France, Netherlands, UK, you name it. And it was, it was just a, a blast. And uh, it was a mixture of uh, back then having party, to be honest. Um, going into, into the courses, explore the country, hiking, And that was so much fun that I just thought, whoa, that was, and the time, it was about six months, which was actually cold six months. Everyone thinking about Greece thing, yeah, it's hot, but it was from October till March. And sometimes we even had snow up down to the beach, but we had no running heating system. So it's not all fun that happened, but it was, it was just a blast as, as, as a total package. So back then I said, wow, that was, that was so cool. I want more. And I approached my, my professor again and said, listen, professor, hey, I, I want to go somewhere else. That was so much fun. Can I do a, a thesis at a university abroad somewhere? And he had uh, Professor Niram was at uh, Georgia Tech, the George W. Woodruff School of, of Biomedical Engineering. And he was reaching out to, to Professor Niram and Professor Niram said, yeah, but, you know, if he's a good student, he could come. He could work on a thesis. And... Uh, He doesn't have to pay tuition, which was good because back then highly expensive and I, I believe um, uh, even up until today highly expensive. So he has to care everything, he has to take care of everything by himself, but he can do some research here, he can, he can write a paper and he doesn't have to pay tuition. So next thing I, I, I realized is I was jumping into a plane and heading towards Atlanta, Georgia. And, and I loved it right there. Um, I mean, the, the research was, was thrilling. It was about uh, trying to create a biological vascular graft. And uh, my little thing was trying to find out if you could add enough elasticity to this tissue uh, by adding hyaluronic acid and, and some other things. And uh, I loved Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I I was trying to find a, a new student apartment because uh, the first couple of nights I um, find a home at an assistant professor 
but being a British fellow, nothing wrong with being British fellows, but he didn't have a car uh, and trying to get around in the United States without a car is almost impossible. So I, I was trying, uh, looking just at the blackboard at university and I said, hey, you know, I'm trying trying to find a new apartment and I was uh, going to those roommates um, search for. And I found through other German students being at not Georgia Tech, but uh, at uh, Georgia State University, and they were there already for about six months. So they they knew how to get around. They could give me a ride in the beginning. Uh, they knew the party places. They knew Buckhead, as which I call the fun zone in Atlanta, Georgia, for you know listening to live music, um, have your drink, and and enjoy. And so it was another six months of of fantastic times of of adventures, of car breaking down in the middle of nowhere. And I, and I bought a 79 old uh, Chevy Caprice for about $500 back then at a Porsche dealer. Uh, but that car brought me from, from Atlanta to to South Carolina, through the Carolinas, Mississippi, up until down to New Orleans and back. Um, and I met uh, back then my new girlfriend. She was from South Africa. And I met her in, in uh, Tampa, Florida, which I drove through. Um, so it was just a blast, and, and I decided back then, well, this is so cool. I, I somehow want to, want to, you know, finish my my diploma, get my master. But if somehow possible, I want to gain some more experience. I want to get some more adventure, basically. With all those experiences, it's hard a little bit to be like you were a tourist first, but you became a traveler right. uh, as you were moving on, right. while at the same time also taking up the serious science work of contributing to a project, to a research project that you were part of. And uh, the result in the end was important for, for, and your contribution was important for the result uh, of, this, uh, of this project. So if it is that way, if it was that way also, what would you or what do you say to students these days at the University of Stuttgart when it comes to going for international experiences? Uh, go for it. <laughs> that's abs that's, I would say it's an absolute must, not necessarily with the focus on career, but what it makes with yourself, how it changes perspectives, um, how you gain all these experience and how you sometimes fail, you know, and, and stand up and what it does with yourself. I, I would say go, go for it. It doesn't have to be United States. It, uh, you can't, it could be any European country. It could be overseas. Last year's or last winter semester lecture, um, I, had, I had one student being at a automotive supplier plant in Poland. I had some other, which we will have uh, the oral exam being end of July because she could not do it at the, at the beginning because she was in South Korea on an internship. And I, I would just encourage everyone, uh, go out, uh, give, it, give it a chance, give it, it doesn't have to be forever. I mean, uh, have a look at it for three, four, five, six months, make your experience, learn, listen, then sure, come back if you like. And that's something that for the rest of your life never ever can be taken away from you, those experiences. And I would say, yeah, go for it. If you bring it to two aspects, what would somebody learn for one's future life? You mentioned just, you know, learn for life here uh, as well by going abroad. What did you learn that you learned really for your future life? Just one or two aspects here and, and on the professional level for your professional uh, career in how far were those experiences relevant Uh, or not, for taking these into the uh, professional areas as well? I think it helps. Well, the, the main, main thing is you are a foreigner and you are abroad. I had hassle with U.S. customs. I had hassle with Canadian customs, uh, sometimes even just because my English was too good. So really number one is, and then being back in Germany and you hear about, I don't know, integration and... I don't know, some tensions there and, and um, how, how we're dealing with it. It is really, really different if you're a, a foreigner and abroad. And suddenly, you, you know, you have U.S. customs. Yeah, but you're not a U.S. citizen. And in my head says, yes, yeah, so what? You know, I'm, I'm a student. I'm, I'm not doing any harm here. So what do you want from me? But that just not happened once, twice. It happened a lot of times. And then you realize 
shoot, how must someone feel being in Germany not being German? So that, that's really one thing that, that uh, changes perspective. And the other one is, I think, really learn to adopt or to deal with situations better. I had planes not leaving. I had thunderstorms. I had, I don't know, things really going wrong when I was in Patras. And I was actually for, for the winter break, I was flying back and I figured, whoo, I did not have enough money with me. So, well, I, I had to negotiate with a cab driver getting me uh, from from Athens train station to to the airport. And uh, the deal was he could uh, drive around his his mom first and then he would pick me up on the return flight and I would give him uh, the money I owe him. And that was, um, again, back then, no no mobile phones, no internet, no way. And that was a deal we, we made and I kept to it. But I, I woke up at about three in the morning trying to get the plane, uh, not the plane, the train from Patras to, to Athens and I figured, shoot, I do not have enough money, but my plane leaves this afternoon at four o'clock. Now, what do I do? So what did we, and there were a lot of other situations like that. Um, and I think it, it helps you adopt and to figure out, even if I do not make it, life won't end. Uh, it's a pain, it's a hassle, it's, it's uh, I don't want this. But you learn to deal with it, you, you learn to adopt, you learn to be more flexible, trying to get through the situation somehow. And even if you don't, hey, so what? Life goes on. Are you still in contact with any international friends that you have made when you were abroad uh, as a student at all? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. But in the meantime, as we heard earlier, you have been abroad quite often. What relevance did these days have for you building up an international network that you may perhaps also draw from now in your position at Fraunhofer Society? I'm considering myself being a true uh, network guy. Um, these days, uh, social media channels or the classical networking platforms such as LinkedIn or Crossing Alps. Um, I mean, I'm a little bit more focused on LinkedIn. But even before the Internet, I, I was seriously picking up the phone and, and calling some old foxes. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, what's up? You know, where are you heading? And I, that could be actually an, an unasked advice um, to, to young people listening out there maintain those networks the student right next to left hand or right hand side 20 25 30 years down the road most likely will be in a very high position job position or self-employed in the industry and sometimes you maybe you, you try to find a new job or sometimes you, you just need some help or you need some insight so that would be actually Maybe the, the only advice during this interview I would give is maintain and maintain your network and, and do this on as many channels and situations you possibly can. I'm, I'm still in contact with friends in the United States and Greece at Georgia Tech, funnily enough. And I'm now going into a lecture, a guest lecturing thing. I'm thinking out loud of maybe one day, maybe next year, doing a little guest lecture at Georgia Tech talking about procurement. And I could not pursue this idea if I would have not um, take care about the networking in the forehand. Yeah, that, that underlines again what you said earlier about relationship management. And uh, once you have a network, then keep it also and contribute to that network by sharing, I guess, uh, yeah. experiences and also including your network members in the work uh, that, uh, that you do. Now, with all of this happening, is there still time for leisure uh, at all uh, in your life? And if so, let's hope for the best. Uh, if so, what do you do for that? Absolutely. That's, that's, well, that's the second unasked advice. Make sure that you find your own balance between profession or studies and, and leisure and spare time. Because if, if you do not take that time for yourself, you really literally will burn out. And no matter how successful you are at this point of time, uh, it doesn't give you a dime if, if you're burned out. So being now 52, <laughs> having two fantastic kids, one, one guy, one, one, one young lady, I'm trying to spend time as much as I can, but quality time. Now that quality time can be anything from, funnily enough, my, my just 10-year-old daughter, 
she's out of this Barbie world now and she's into Marvel. And uh, uh, we were watching her first two Marvel movies and I just made sure that when it gets too cruel or explosive, I, you know, I, I uh, fast forward. But sitting with her on the couch and looking Marvel or uh, what I really enjoy a lot on sports is horse riding. I'm, I'm doing horse riding since I was 12 years old. And we just actually this March bought a new horse because my old one passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, now I really do make those times available for myself. For being at the horse, I'm, I'm doing it on a little bit more sportive level. So it really helps me sometimes being into the sports and, and work with the horse. But being with the horse, being in, in contact with that with that living animal and I switch off my mobile phone and uh, once I'm at the at the stable it is my time with the horse and, uh, and I make sure that I always do have enough time in doing that absolutely so the work life balance is of essential absolutely. importance uh, absolutely. and you found a way to uh, to address that both in your family but also well with your own Hobby horse, uh, and uh, as, as we can call it quite aptly, I guess, at this moment. Okay, Andreas, towards the end of our conversation, we have uh, something that we call Moment 7. This means we would come up with seven questions, very short questions. Okay. And please just answer also in a very brief way uh, to, to these. Sometimes a word will do, sometimes a short sentence will do as well. And again, moment seven uh, questions here for you. Moment one, Spätzle or Maultaschen? Uh, Maultaschen. Moment two, one thing you could change about the world. Get a lasting COVID cure. Moment three. Do you have a book recommendation? Actually, Bill Gates' book about ways out of the climate change. I'm in the middle of it. I haven't read it entirely, but he has some very interesting thoughts and I think we should listen. Moment four. The best advice you have ever received. Coming from my grandma who raised me, listen to your heart. Moment five, your favorite place on campus. Actually, there is none. I, I love the place itself. Just uh, being vibrant, being full of students, being full of life. That's, that's a fantastic place. Moment six, if I could start all over again, I would do the following differently. Listen more to my heart. And moment seven. Please complete the following sentence. Thanks to my studies, I know that. Thanks to my studies, I still so good in math that I can help my eighth grader at home trying to prepare for exams. Thank you, Andreas, for this lovely talk and for your time today. We are looking forward to staying in touch and wish you the best of luck with everything you do, whether It's made in science or beyond. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you for having me. It was, uh, it was a blast. Thank you. <laughs>